works in 12 different cities, partnering with over 300 schools, working and training with over a thousand coaches and reaching 12,000 plus young poet athletes. Poet athletes, as we call them, have written collectively over 43,000 poems. We are so honored to bring this community together for the Soccer Summit today. Alicia Yano, two snaps for Alicia, has brought together an incredible lineup of inspirational leaders in the, in the game. And we know that you will be inspired and we hope that you will take action and amplify your voice. One of the best ways to amplify your voice is by signing up to be a Women in Soccer member. It's totally free and it will increase your soccer connections in your community and it's easy to do. So sign up for Women in Soccer and support the cause. Second shout out to Goal 5. Definitely go check out their website. Apparel for her. They are innovative and it's about time, right? So definitely check out Goal 5. Big shout outs to the community. You could actually be a lucky winner today. Goal 5 is giving out one prize to each at each session. They're giving out a prize to one, one random attendee. So cross your fingers, it could be you. Get ready to be inspired in true scores fashion. I'm gonna close out my welcome with a poem written by Marlene, who was only nine when she wrote this. Mm. It's called, You Make Me Feel Unstoppable. Like nobody can hurt me. The world is mine. You can always calm me down and make me feel free. You give me those indescribable strong feelings deep inside, like no one else could give except you. The sweet breeze running through my flowing hair. Who are you? It's you, soccer. <laughs> Enough said, I'll pass the mic to Elizabeth Cook, award-winning journalist. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for taking oh. your time. Thank you to the speakers and game on. Game on. Thank you so much to everybody at SCORES. Good morning and welcome to the SCORES Soccer Summit, a week-long event aimed at empowering young people through sports and mentorship. This week, we'll be speaking to legendary athletes and leaders in the world of soccer. As she mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Cook. I anchor weeknights for KPIX5 here in San Francisco. I'm also a former athlete and believe in the power that team sports and positive coaching and mentorship can have on a young person. It's no question the lessons you take away from those experiences can have an invaluable impact on really the rest of your life. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by two icons in the world of soccer, Julie Foudy and Brandi Chastain. These ladies really need no introduction, but I'm just going to do a quick recap of their extraordinary careers. I mean, I could spend a whole hour talking about each and every, each of them, but I'm just going to sum it up real quickly. Julie Foudy, two-time World Cup champion, two-time Olympic gold medalist, the U.S. national team captain from 2000-2004. She played professionally with the San Diego Spirit and was inducted into the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame in 2007. In 2006, she founded the Julie Foudy Sports Leadership Academy. Brandi Chastain, two-time World Cup champion, two-time Olympic gold medalist. She played professionally as well in the Japan Professional League, the San Jose Cyber Rays, F FC Gold Pride, and California Storm in March of 2017. She also was inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. And in 2018, she was inducted into the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame. Very proud <laughs> to have some two Bay Area ladies here. I'm gonna start at the very beginning. How did you get started in soccer? The simplest question. <laughs> Brandy, go sister. Totally randomly. And Elizabeth, I want you to, to know that you can't say former athlete. Okay. <laughs> athlete, always an athlete. All, All right? right, there you go. That. That's yours. That's like the Olympic family. Once an Olympian, always an Olympian. Always an okay? Olympian. Yeah. Um, I got involved in soccer very randomly. Uh, my parents, I think, initially understood that I was very active. And it just so happened that soccer came to my neighborhood. We had zero experience in the game, but they said, gosh, we, we have to find her something that, you know, that she can do because I'm either at the top of the tree or on the roof or, you know, doing who knows what off, off a skateboard. And, and so they signed me up and nobody uh, was taking the coaching responsibility. And so my dad said, okay, I'll do it. And we learned soccer together, going to the library, watching the one VHS tape they had in the library, and the rest is pretty much history. Wow. We fell in love. 
<laughs> you in the game of soccer, no question. And Julie, what about you? How'd you get started? I, I um, very similar, hyperactive child that wanted to chase a shiny object all the time. And so uh, my, my parents were like, please, just something to keep her moving and active. And uh, I was a total tomboy. I love to um, just get dirty and be outside. And so it just came naturally. I started playing with a bunch of boys at, at uh, elementary school and I'd be like, mom, let's go. I'm six, let's sign me up. She's like, you're too young, I can't yet. And we actually just, got started at the perfect time because AYSO, everyone of course knows is the rec league, mm -hmm. um, was just getting going in my community. And so I got on that for a year and then quickly onto a club team. And yeah, so it was basically, I think uh, I was the fourth of four kids. It was basically like, oh my gosh, give this child something. So she just <laughs> nuts. Burn her out. Yeah. <laughs> As a mother of two boys, I can relate to that, having to burn them out every single day. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the sisterhood and the mentorship that comes with playing women's soccer and what you've experienced throughout your careers, not only when you started off when you were little girls, but taking it all the way through to the women's national team. Brandy, I'll start with you. Yeah, gosh, I, I think number one was just the friendships that we made uh, was so important. And nobody was out to win any World Cups or Olympics because they they didn't exist at that point, right? So there was, mm -hmm. you know, it really was about neighborhood. It was about families. I mean, I think that all began because my dad was a Marine. He basically understood that, you know, you're in it for the betterment of the guys next to you. And mm -hmm. you always took care of each other and you always stayed together. And so we were very uh, much a family, uh, you know, with slumber parties and pizza parties. And honestly, if we knew what the score at the end of the game was, or if we won the tournament, that wasn't really the, the measuring stick of the, the fun we had or the success there was. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say I wasn't competitive. I think I was as competitive as all get out, but um, just being with friends, I think was really the mo most important thing in that it was kind of a village, you know, I think as parents, we talk about having a village now. And th this was the village in which I grew up in. And those families became my family. And mm -hmm. I'm still friends with, uh, I would say a handful of those girls from the first soccer team I ever played on. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's my, your experience? My uh, green machine soccerettes. Oh. <laughs> it was all about right yes. I grew up yes. I was so lucky because I got to stay on the same team for like 10 years from like seven oh wow yeah and um we were the soccer ets literally and we're <laughs> green striped dolphin shorts yes oh yeah uh, and so solid like shorty shorts um for those of you who weren't born in the 80s or 70s uh and so <laughs> Literally every green team that would walk up to the national team, I would start singing my song. No, 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 nobody messes with the green machine. And and then Brandy and the other national team was going to be like, oh my God, shut up. Oh, no, we would say sing it more, sing it more. It's so awesome. We love it. Yeah. And by the end of their careers, you know, almost 20 years later, every green team, they'd go, no, 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 nobody messes with the green machine. So, um, I, and they are to Brandy's point, they're still yeah. some of my best friends. And, you know, I've been really blessed because my college team, Stanford, um, the fine institution of Stanford university. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> like go trees. Yeah. <laughs> was, um, you know, are still some of my best friends and the national team teammates. I mean, people always say, are you still friends with them? I'm like, yes, they're stuck with me forever. Right. We talk mm. all the time. And so, it really is, and it's why I, I want young people and young women to get involved in sports because beyond yeah. all the physical aspects of it, it's just this gift mm -hmm. that you'll have with you for the rest of your life. And this friendship and sisterhood that is irreplaceable. It's something that um, really I will cherish forever because they're just such neat women. And, and, I, think the, and I think, sorry, Elizabeth, one more thing. I think beyond all of that, what Julie said, and those are the most, I think, precious things. It's also, we're moving into this new era of women, you know, in the C-suites and women who are making decisions. And, mm -hmm. and now there's a, there's a, uh, 
a, a population of women who now can be resources to other women, right? Mm -hmm. If, you know, I'm, I'm in a new tech space in myself and I'm going to Julie and I'm going to my friends from sports mm -hmm. and I'm asking them, Hey, can you support me in this way? Or, mm -hmm. you know, do you have any connections in, in this field? And so I think that's something for a long time that just wasn't present for women. And mm -hmm. now all of a sudden we have this deep well of resources that um, really, I think can like, you know, before we were talking about women in soccer, women in soccer will now allow for young women to find those resources that they need in people that look like themselves mm -hmm. and who have had similar experiences. So I think that's, that is a ancillary benefit that we get from sports beyond those friendships and those life lasting um, um, people that we will, you know, call our friends forever. Ancillary. Yeah, it, that's a really good word, Brandy. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Santa Clara I, University. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure I remind everybody that this is more of a conversation, but if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And as we kind of continue on, I'll make sure to try to, to try to get to those. I mean, you made a great point talking about um, the sisterhood of, of athletics and how important that is. I'm curious, you know, throughout your careers, can you, I'm, I'm sure you got a lot of great advice um, as you matured and as you grew up, not only as an athlete, but also as young women. Can you think of anything in particular that was a really great um, piece of advice you either got from a coach or a, a teammate throughout your career that really stuck with you and resonated with you? Brandy, I'll start with you. <laughs> uh, I probably had too many, Elizabeth, to <laughs> mention because I, I was a bit of a mess in my earlier days um, mm -hmm. um, to be argued that it's still not the same um, anyway but I think there's two that that really um, have stuck one mm -hmm. came from my grandfather when I was really really young and he used to give me a dollar for scoring a goal I love scoring goals it was like my driving force and you know, I woke up thinking about them. I went to bed thinking about them. I was a little bit of a, what I think would be called the ball hog, right? I wanted the ball all the time. I wanted to be the one who scored. But then he gave me a dollar fifty for an assist. And so he really instilled in me that, you know, giving was really better than receiving. And so that's kind of lasted in the things that I do that I things that I did on the field and then they translated to the things I did off the field so with Julie and Marlene Bjornsrud and the and the uh, building of the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative um, and the volunteerism that goes along with bossy girls you know this whole idea of giving I think is something that really um, has stuck with me and the game itself is gives so much so mm -hmm. that that's one I think the second one was in the quarterfinals uh, in Washington, D.C. with the national team of the 99 World Cup, you know, I scored an own goal. And so when you do that, that's like the worst mistake you can possibly make in soccer, right? And the fact that it was the first knockout round of the World Cup, even worse. But Carla came over, Carla Overbeck, our captain, came over to me right after that. And she said, don't worry about it. You know, we're, we have a lot of game left to play and we're going to go on and win this game and you're going to help us. Mm -hmm. And so I think two things in that moment, she did, I don't think she initially thought that this would stick with me the rest of my life. But one is we all have the ability to impact somebody's life in a positive way. Um, and we just have to be ready for that moment. And being ready for that moment is just being more aware of the people around you and 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 being willing to put yourself out there for them. And so in that moment, I think um, Carla really gave me a gift that uh, has, I have shared with so many other people and reminded them about their power and about the openness and the vulnerability it takes to receive that information too. So I think those, those two things were, are, have been really transformative for me uh, mm -hmm. in my life and then how I get to share those things with other people. Mm -hmm. Well, that you, Julie. What's the question again? Oh, just, you know, as you were, you know, any kind of piece of advice that you have received throughout, not only as you grew up as a woman, but also as an athlete that really resonated with you and you kind of go back to even to this day. Um, Billie Jean King, who is obviously the tennis legend and uh, advocate for so many female athletes. I got mm -hmm. to meet Billie Jean when I was a uh, in the 90s and a younger athlete 
uh, mid nineties. And she became a huge mentor for me and our team and a friend to this day, a dear friend. Um, and I remember saying to Billy, uh, right before the 99 world cup, gosh, I'm so nervous about, uh, this world cup because we're hosting it of course we're in huge stadiums there's a lot of pressure for us to be successful for the tournament to be successful so that the crowds show up and uh, and she looked at me kind of cross-eyed like sister what are you talking about and she looked at me she goes Fowdy, pressure is a privilege <laughs> and like, oh yes it is like shut yeah. up and, and embrace it yeah she, shut up but it was like come on embrace it this is awesome. Yeah. You've worked your tail off. And, and she was right. I mean, and that became yeah. kind of our, our mantra for that tournament and, um, and what our team did really well. I mean, it was the mm -hmm. best advice we were given. It's like, you've put in the work. Mm -hmm. When you get to that moment, you choose how you want to face that moment, right? Of, mm -hmm. of pressure or of, um, do you want it to strangle you and suck mm -hmm. the joy out of it? Or do you want to wrap your arms around it and be like, yes, I've done this. I'm, I'm okay. And we're going to enjoy mm -hmm. this moment. We're going to soak mm -hmm. it in. And we were really good at that as a team mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. finding this balance of pressure and joy, mm -hmm. which is a conscious thing. And mm -hmm. it isn't a coincidence that we were good at it because we didn't take things too seriously. And our coach allowed for that and our culture on our team allowed for that, where we would have a ton of fun and play practical jokes on Brandy every single day because <laughs> so many things. There's so much low hanging fruit for her you could do. Um, I mean, oh. every day we would play a joke on her and it's like so easy. She's so easy. <laughs> and so that was kind of our culture. That, Elizabeth, that's so not true. Poor it's Brandy. just that I wanted, no, 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 no. I wanted <laughs> Julie to feel good about herself. So I gave oh. I, uh, that's called team. That's called teamwork. They're a self-sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked and we've spoken a lot on, on, at the SCORE Summit about how the values that you gain from being a part of not only a team, but just being a female athlete that you learn about resilience, you learn about perseverance, you learn about how, how to lose, how to win. You know, a lot of us are going through a really difficult time right now. It's just been a hard year. 2020 has been a rough year with 2020 and a lot of the social activism and People have had their own personal struggles. Do you feel like during this time and in times when, you know, a lot of stuff is out of your control that you tap in to the strengths and the values you gain from soccer to kind of get you through the tough times? Julie, I'll start with you. Um, absolutely. I think mm -hmm. that is, again, the gift of mm -hmm. what you learn is that, um, adversity and challenges are something that are just part of it, right? It's mm -hmm. part of life. It's part of sports. It's, you know, one of the things um, I always think about in, in, in these moments is how, how do you want the story to end, right? How mm -hmm. do you want to write the story? You control how the story is told mm -hmm. and you control how you deal with these moments. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're hard mm -hmm. and you know, they're hard for a lot of people. Um, but also you try and find the silver linings and it's not to dismiss the hard. I think, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to sit in it a little bit and say, yeah, it, it, it does stink right now what we're going through or what, um, what we have been living through for the last year. But you also then realize like, okay, but I control what it looks like going forward. And I control what I want to look back on and say, how do we deal with it? You know, and mm -hmm. as a parent with, with kids, I have a 12 and a 13 year old, you know, mm -hmm what was their experience life and what kind of behavior am I modeling to them mm -hmm. in this time? If I'm saying it's sucky all the time and I'm showing that it's sucky all the time, they're going to be living the same way. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, playing sports and being surrounded by amazing women like Brandy and all those, you know, women for so many years, they taught me the value of being able to control that outcome mm -hmm. in a positive way and extracting mm -hmm. a lesson from it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Brandy? Well, I just, I, I can't um, say it any better than Julie did. The only thing I'll add is having had some really difficult times myself in terms of physical, let's mm -hmm. say some physical injuries, mm -hmm. you know, those taught me that I am strong. You know, having dealt with one ACL reconstruction was hard enough. Dealing with a second one um, mm -hmm. compounded um, it, you know, but it also um, I think highlighted that what Julie says, we are resilient, we are strong, you know, it, it gave me a, a real life physical um, 
example that, yeah, it's, it's not perfect, right? Sitting mm -hmm. on the sideline and, and watching the game go by and not being able to influence the outcome. Mm -hmm. And these are metaphors for life too, not just in soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that, that will be your role, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, as a player on the national team, you didn't get to start every game and you didn't get to play every minute. And sometimes you came off the bench and sometimes you didn't play at all. And so in those moments too, those are great reminders of what can I give? Mm -hmm. You know, it, I say to my players all the time, because everybody wants to start and everybody wants to play. I mm -hmm. said, you worry more about counting minutes than you do about recognizing the moments of quality that you can give. Mm -hmm. And whether that quality is getting the water to the sideline uh, so that your teammate can um, quench their thirst and be ready to make the next play, or whether it's cheering as loud as you can from the sideline, or mm -hmm. it's playing five minutes at the end of the game and keeping the, and preserving a win, for example, mm -hmm. you know, I, I say you, you get upset about not, not starting yet. You have a really big opportunity. And so I think we have to see what it is we can do as opposed mm -hmm. to what we can't do. And that's not easy. And like Julie said, it takes practice and our team practice it a lot. Mm -hmm. And personally, I had to practice it a lot with, um, w in different moments and, and it really, I believe, helped me for the time when I had to make a big decision or I've had to make big decisions. Mm -hmm. And I know I can take that deep breath. I can find that calm in the storm. And I can say, look, I'm going to put myself out there. I'll be that vulnerable person that I know that I have to be. Mm -hmm. And if it goes well, awesome. And if it doesn't right. go well, I'll, I'll figure out what didn't work and then I'll move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think moving forward, no question, is the challenge, and 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 knowing how to do that well, is 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 a gift that that is learned only by experience. I want to take it to um, our little chat here and ask some questions. Um, I'm, this one comes from um, Gina Turnbull. Did you ever go through a phase where you started to lose interest in soccer and would rather have more of a social life? And how do you kind of regain that focus? No question, both of you had to make some major sacrifices to get to where you are. <laughs> Yeah, well, I did for sure. I, yeah. I, I, I ahead, had a, a period where um, I actually stopped playing to play volleyball, and I always was a multi-sport athlete. I mean, mm -hmm. I know times are different now, and it's a challenge to mm -hmm. be able to do that with your kids. It's something mm -hmm. I'm working on right now. I'm like, no, you will play multiple sports. You're <laughs> not just going to one sport. Um, because it always kept me fresh, right? Mm -hmm. there, there were moments where I just wanted to do something else. And I, you know, I wouldn't play soccer uh, for a stretch to kind of get a break from it and mentally, physically. Um, so absolutely. I think, you know, th those moments I look back on and I'm mm -hmm. glad that I didn't have a parent who was like, no, you will continue to play because, you know, these 17 players are playing over here in this, at this level. And you got to just keep grinding away because I saw a lot of friends who had parents like that, who mm -hmm. ended up leaving the sport entirely in high mm -hmm. school because they were like, this is no fun. And so you have to seek the joy in it over and over again. And if yeah. it's not giving you joy, take a bit of a break and it's okay to do that. But mm -hmm. I think making sure you have other interests and other things you're doing as well mm -hmm. is hugely helpful. Soccer was never my only thing, right? I didn't identify just with soccer. And that mm -hmm. I think is an important thing we should all remember as humans. Yeah. Brandy, how about you? Again, um, coming after Julie, I have to say it's, you know, Sorry. similar, similar. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I love soccer every day. I love it mm -hmm. now. I'm actually in the middle of my senior A license uh, for U.S. soccer. And I just find such joy in the game. But there was definitely times when I played other sports because mm -hmm. that's the way I grew. That's the way I grew up. That was my generation. You know, we, we didn't have this um, sports specific mentality that we have now, which I think uh, Julie's very, very, very right on, which is, uh, you know, it, it's detrimental in my opinion, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there are so many great things to be learned outside of your specific sport that you can actually bring back to your sport. Mm -hmm. um, I played baseball. I remember baseball being something that was really critical to my soccer career because it, it really taught me how to watch the flight of the ball, how to move my feet, how to organize behind that mm -hmm. and how to get ready to receive that ball. And so I use that uh, analogy a lot and I, and with my kids now. And so I think cross, um, cross 
training and sports is really is really important. And in terms of sacrifices, you know, I, I really, sometimes I have to say I cringe when I hear, hear that word because I chose to play soccer. Mm -hmm. I chose not to go to some other things because mm -hmm. it was more exciting for me over here. And mm -hmm. so I don't think I sacrificed one thing. And I was given some great gifts through the game and I, I wouldn't have done it any other way. Maybe I would have done it even better if I could go back and do it again, but I'm, I'm really grateful. And I think that gratitude of having the opportunity to play and participate is, is as critical as the time you spend because that's where the joy that Julie's talking about comes from, right? The mm -hmm. ability to have to go to a practice where you know you're gonna get your butt kicked right? You know, it's going to be that day. And you're just like, uh, instead of dreading it, you're going to be like, hell yeah, I'm going to take this thing on. And that's another thing I learned from Julie and my teammates was kind of this fearlessness about the moment, right? Because mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of moments that scare the heck out of you mm -hmm. and make you want to say, nope, I'm not in for that right now, or I can't mm -hmm. do it today. And that takes again, practice. But I think, you know, the that having good people around you. And that's why sports I think is really so critical for young girls too, is that if, when you have good people around you and they, they are living examples of being fearless and being strong and being brave and sometimes falling down, mm -hmm. then you see that there is a pathway that it doesn't have to be perfect, mm -hmm. but um, it's there and yeah. you can be successful in those moments. Yeah. I love that point talking about not looking at it as a sacrifice, but as a privilege to not only be able to play the game, but have the resources to be able to do so. It's a great right. perspective, I think, especially when, you know, you're a teenager and you're like, you know, there's lots of different distractions going on. It's easy to <laughs> oh, kind yeah. of lose focus or think that something else is more important, but that's a great um, great perspective. I, you know, I want to go back to a lot of people want to know about that 1999 World Cup game. It was, I was there. It was amazing. I was telling the, the ladies before we started, I'm sitting there with my girlfriend and we're just crying. And, you know, so many of us remember what happened during the game, but I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, go back to the sisterhood and the, mm -hmm. and the um, sportsmanship and, and the value of, of having those relationships with your teammates you know, is there a moment that you remember either on the sidelines or in the locker room that, that comes back to you when you think about that game? Oh gosh, so, <laughs> so many things, you know, that yeah. final game was so um, amazing. I, I finally watched it for the first time during the pandemic mm -hmm. and I, I really was astonished at the intensity and the, and the level of commitment to every single moment in the game it was mm -hmm. just and it was so hot that day and it was mm -hmm. like god it was just oppressively uh intense and hot and mm -hmm. everything you hope for but what people you know may not know is that leading up to that game we drove to the stadium and we of course we're all excited we got our hair done and our fingernails done yeah. and you know everybody's like we had just a big slumber party the night before and it was yeah. seriously it was like 12 year old girls <laughs> and um then we couldn't get onto the field because the third fourth place game was going on and so now you're in the biggest game of your life and now you don't get to touch the ball on the field so yes. What do we do, Jules? What do we do? We turned the music up. We, we turned our hats sideways That's and backwards and, and we just danced and we laughed and we high-fived each other. We ran in a circle and up and down the tunnel and we just made the most of it. And I think that really is, I think the essence of what this national team was about, right? Mm -hmm. We were never uh, surprised by something not going right. Mm -hmm. And when something went a little bit out of what we thought might be the norm, we just said, okay, we'll embrace that and we'll make that the new situation and we'll go forward. I, I'm, I've been really impressed. Uh, the more I think back on it, how incredibly resilient this group of people were and how mm -hmm. flexible and agile they were in moments because sitting in row 36 next to the smoking section for 12 hours to China in a middle seat was not ideal. And so if you can endure that, you can pretty much think that you're going to be able to endure anything. <laughs> right, Jules? Okay. Well, I, uh, I was supposed to be the fifth kicker, uh -huh. <laughs> take the penalty kicks. And Tony was like, no, dump Julie, put Brandy in there. 
I found this out after the World Cup. So Brandy, thank God, I was, you know, Brandy was <laughs> one, and of course we know what happens. She makes it, she scores, she gets naked. So, so <laughs> I, I would have had to gone if she was to miss it because I was six. Um, and I was like, please just make this Brandy, let's be done. I remember <laughs> at the minutes drive going, let's go, let's just go have a party. Thank you made it because no one wants to see this, these abs. <laughs> well, we do now. Hey, Elizabeth, I, yeah. I'm just, I'm looking at the chat here and I want to call out Michelle mm -hmm. who, who wrote a little note. And I think this is really something that I think was really special about 99, but also special about our team. And I think mm -hmm. really embraced by our team, which is kind of this, um, this relationship we had with the fans. Michelle's mm -hmm. talking about how she, she came to the stadium and she was, in Chicago and she brought her three-year-old and the three-year-old was getting antsy. And, and I came over and said, hello. And I picked up the three-year-old and it was like a, uh -huh. a, a mom moment. But mm -hmm. and I think that this team was so willing at, at that time. And it's different now, obviously, and things, um, you know, there's a little bit of a separation between the players and the fans. And, mm -hmm. um, but I think part of what, what we did in 99, for example, was, you know, we were, we were knocking on doors and hugging babies and kissing them and doing clinics and just selling women's soccer. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all say we're really pretty grateful that women's soccer is a household sport name, right? right. The U S women's national team is known and that is phenomenal. And I think that was through the work of a lot of people, whether that was on the field or behind the scenes uh, in their commitment to growing the game. But the, the moments that we could have with the fans and be up close, so we're really priceless, to be honest with you. It's, it's really what made everything so fun. So to Michelle out there, I'm glad that uh, we had our moment and that um, we, we really got a chance to be closer and to share the game. Uh, everybody's involved. I think that's one thing about women in soccer that I'm really looking forward to is you know, it doesn't matter what angle you come to the game from mm -hmm. as a parent, as a fan, as a coach, as a, um, as a mentor, as a, you know, as a player, as you know, a, a physician, whatever it is, your position is, we all belong mm -hmm. and there's always time for each other. So, I mean, it's just special. I, mm -hmm. I can't yeah. love it enough, you know, to be honest with you. Now I can't, I can't, I can't go without noticing. There's a, a very famous picture um, behind oh. your shoulder there, Brandy. <laughs> I know till the end of time, everyone's going to ask you about that. Look at you, moment. You her glasses. <laughs> I can't see anything. I was like, I wouldn't be able to read the chat if I wanted to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, look at that. There's That's some good. Crazy. There's some great comments. Everybody loves you. Um, so you know, you victoriously ripped off your shirt in that celebration. So much has been said and sort of interpreted uh, by that move. But given today's conversation to surrounding pay equity. Do you still think that statement or do you think that that statement opened the door for conversations we're having now about equal pay for women? Do you think that that's, that's kind of the first move that started it? Jules? I'm exhausted by this conversation, to be honest with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> so exhausted. No, no, you don't have to say you're sorry. The chat, finally, because I have my glasses on. So. <laughs> Say that again, Elizabeth. I thought you were going to Brandy. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I just I'm curious, you know, that iconic moment, you know, where she rips off her shirt and it's saying basically to to so many, I know myself, I definitely felt this, that it's okay to celebrate like the guys do. We're, you know, we're worth it. We can do it. And I'm wondering if that was if that move was really the catalyst that started, you know, the eventual conversation that we're having now, probably too late, about pay equity. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. That's a, one that has never been asked that way before, actually. And I do think it was this moment of like, yes, I am strong. This is me. This is mm -hmm. me and my glory. Um, and I love that. I love that image of like flexing in the most organic, authentic of ways. Because mm -hmm. as soccer players know, when back in the day, when they scored, men took their t tops off. Mm -hmm. And Brandy, which people probably didn't know was a total soccer junkie and watched soccer all the time. And that's what she'd grown up on, right? Mm -hmm. Is you scored and you took your shirt off. Um, obviously that doesn't happen nowadays, but it used to back in the day. And I love that it was 
this image of just a strong woman mm -hmm. and who um, was willing to say, this is, this is me in my most authentic, joyful way of celebrating this moment. And so mm -hmm. I do think it's uh, iconic in a sense of that was so unheard of at that time for women to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um nowadays i think it's probably uh, a little easier for women to do that but i mm -hmm. don't think back then it was and so i love that brandy was like screw it here's here's who i am and this is what i'm doing um <laughs> i think it said a lot about you know where we should be with women's sports mm -hmm. and it helps that she had a really nice six pack <laughs> <laughs> I, do you look we at were, it like that brandy as, as it being that impactful literally so, wait. In the room, and i was like how come i don't look like that we would <laughs> same amount of weights right do you remember that brandy i was always oh, yeah. like come on how come i don't have <laughs> biceps like that you can get it less. Uh, it's inspiration for me uh you know i'm i'm going to say that you know there was no forward thinking about that moment and I think even you saying elizabeth and julie you saying you know that's the way the guys celebrated to be honest with you I never look at soccer as a, uh, a gender specific sport. And I always just felt, you know, we were just soccer players and, mm -hmm. and maybe this kind of naive approach to the fact that I thought I could be in the NFL when I was a young kid, you know, my mm -hmm. godfather was played in the old time NFL with leather helmets and I played in the street, you know, I, I just never saw myself separated. And so, mm -hmm. Perhaps it was that kind of that being naive about what you could or couldn't do mm -hmm. freed me and I think our team to be brave and to stand up and even have the courage to when, you know, a room full of uh, media people were asking, is this tournament really going to go? I remember this in San Francisco, Jules, and, uh, and I think you will too, you, me, Carla, and uh, they were asking, will this really go off like you're saying it's going to? Are you really going to be able to fill these big stadiums? Mm -hmm. And we boldly said, yes, of course we will. You know, we have, we have a team full of people who are working their tails off behind the scenes with the Women's World Cup Committee. We've got a tremendous uh, amount of talent with our team. We're working really hard. You know, we are preparing to be the best we can be. And then literally we're like, We'd be walking out going, are we really going to do this? Like, you know, but we put on this brave face because, you know, we knew, I think we knew how important it was, but maybe not to the scale that it actually ended up being. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the success of that, like anything else, and what I tell my kids is like, boy, you know, go big or go home, right? If you're going to, if you're going to do something, you might as well just blow it out. Mm -hmm. Just go for it. <laughs> because what's what's going to happen? Someone's going to tell yeah. you, no, who cares? Like that's, that doesn't hurt me. That's like, all right, your opinion, I'll figure out my yes, you know, and get on with it. And so for that moment, I, I really don't think it was, it, there was never a conscious thought about this is what the men do, or this is what soccer players do. It was just, it felt like the thing to do. And mm -hmm. it felt like that was the perfect expression of for that moment. Mm -hmm. And I love having the conversation like we're having right now about all the positive things that, that have come from that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and even the ones who didn't really agree with it. I think those conversations are really important because the gap I think between women's sports and the, all of society in terms of how they saw women's sports was huge. Mm -hmm. It was massive between how Julie felt about herself being an athlete and how maybe the general Joe public felt. And so I think what we did is we closed the gap mm -hmm. and we showed them something that they could be like, wow, that was quite impressive. Mm -hmm. And now they feel differently about it. Yeah. Now it's a it's fabulous perspective. Julie, I know, you, I know you have a hard out in about two minutes because you have to go and do your podcast, right? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. No, no, no. That's, not, that's, that's lingo force. You got to go have donuts. Let's be honest. <laughs> no, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> interviewing kelly o'hara for our podcast oh, nice. oh very cool okay well I, I i just wanted to get one last question in with you julie i want to talk a little bit about your sports leadership leadership academy because it ties in so well with the summit 
that we're having right now. I mean, what, why do you, why was that important for you to start an organization like that? Yeah, I, I had always been doing just soccer camps for mm -hmm. years, you know, mm -hmm. going back quite a ways and felt like, gosh, we're, we're missing a huge component of what I love about sports, which is all the things we've talked about, right? The sisterhood, mm -hmm. the leadership, the life lessons, this gift that is sports. And couldn't we do that in a residential platform and setting that use sports as the vehicle to teach kids about being not just a great athlete, but more mm -hmm. importantly, a great human and giving mm -hmm. back to their communities and planting that seed at a young age that you mm -hmm. have the power to do this, that everyone has, as we say at the Leadership Academy, leadership is personal, not positional, that everyone has it inside them. It's just, you got to unleash it and figure mm -hmm. out how you want to lead and which way you want to lead. And so, mm -hmm. um, I, my husband and uh, a friend I grew up playing with on the soccerettes, uh, again, lifelong <laughs> friends, right? And her husband and another friend, the five of us started it like 15 years ago, and we've been doing it for 15 years, and it's super fun. And now we obviously don't just have soccer. We have water polo and lacrosse and basketball, mm -hmm. and it's all sports, and we do it on the East Coast, and we do it at Menlo College there in mm -hmm. Atherton. So um, it's been this little passion play of mine for many years. And I now, cause we've been doing it so long, you know, you have these amazing women at Google or Amazon or different places who are like, I went to your leadership Academy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And I'm like, Oh, this is what I wanted. Right. And it, and it made me think differently about what I could do and what I could be. Wow. And, wow. um, and that really is, you know, is the power of sport if, mm -hmm. uh, if channeled properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how you see the lineage, how, what you learn <clears throat> from sports and how that carries through the rest of your life. Well, I, Julie, we'd love for you to stay, but I, I, I know you got to go and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you longer, but it was so nice to meet you. And thank you thank for joining the Scores you Summit. Me, and thank you to America Scores for all the great work they do. Peace yeah. out, sister. <laughs> All right, Brandy, I, I, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about um, concussions. It's something that's been brought up in the chats over the last couple of days is something that people are really interested in. And, and I know that you have a lot of thoughts on the issue. You even uh, mentioned, I believe, that you donate your brain to science after, right. after you pass away for, for this purpose. Do you think enough is being done about concussion, not only awareness, but prevention? I mean, the, the word enough, I'm not sure we can fill enough, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if one person experiences concussion, then it's not enough. Mm -hmm. But I think we are doing something. And mm -hmm. I think something right now is better than nothing. And, and, you know, like most things, it, time is really what um, matters. And there's a lot of people spending a lot of time uh, doing research. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working with Chris Nowinski and Dr. Cantu in Boston for the Concussion Legacy Institute, and they do tremendous work. Um, honestly, I believe, you know, it's up to every single coach and every single director of coaching in every club around the country, whether it's mm -hmm. recreational to elite soccer, to recognize that we have a great opportunity to teach our kids how to in my opinion, you know, heading the ball was a, what I, in my position, became slightly known for. I, I was very courageous. I would, you know, say, hey, I'll do it. You know, um, I'll take this one. And, you know, with no thought about what the point was. But, you know, we as coaches now, as leaders now, as uh, mentors now, I want to help pro protect the players mm -hmm. so that they can play soccer longer, right? They, they mm -hmm. can enjoy the game for as long as they, they choose to be on the field and as, for as long as they then choose to be on the sideline. And I think part of that comes from the idea of how to position yourself in space and be more spatially aware and be aware of the players around you and the concept of having your head up and recognizing and seeing um, the speed at which players are coming into space and going out of space. Mm -hmm. And that takes a long time. And you can't, you know, I think, what I'm really proud about is that we, we forced the age up to 11, right? Before it was just a recommendation. We don't recommend that young kids under the age of 10 and younger head the ball. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's just a recommendation, but it's not a hard, fast rule. So now mm -hmm. the rule is 11 and younger cannot head the ball. So now as coaches, we can focus on getting the ball onto the ground. How do we do that? Put the ball into the air, trap it onto the ground, get the ball mm -hmm. on the ground as fast as you can be in athletic positions, be in knees bent, 
um, prepared to absorb pressure, um, sometimes even initiate pressure. So then you can get the ball onto the ground. And so for me, I think that's one of the causes I feel really strongly about in terms of and, and advocate for, which is, you know, sometimes the ball is going to get into the air and we will head the ball. I'm not saying take that take heading out of the game, but let's Mm -hmm. preserve our youngest, most vulnerable players Mm -hmm. and people. Mm -hmm. And let's give that to the older high school age Mm -hmm. where physically we're a little bit more mature. Cognitively, Mm -hmm. we want to think we're mature where we're just now starting to be able to make some good decisions. And Mm -hmm. we know that, you know, that frontal lobe is not quite fully developed yet either. And so you know, we still want to protect those, those young players. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's up to us coaches and, and the directors to make sure that uh, we do that. And mm-hmm. so that's what I'm advocating for. Yeah. You know, uh, a very important part of, this is kind of a segue, but it goes into one of the questions here in the chat. Um, Colin says that rumor has it that Brandy wrote a poem, obviously poetry, uh, big part of America's scores, um, that you are a, indeed a poet athlete. Um, <laughs> that she keeps it in her desk drawer. Interesting. And then she read it at another event. Do you want to, do you, can you tell us about this poem? I, I wish and, I had, I wish I could hear it. I wish I could <laughs> as a like, matter pull of it that. right out of my pocket, <laughs> uh, but it, it is in my drawer. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to indulge you or bore you with a little bit of it. You'll see why. Hold on just a second. Okay. Okay. And I'm not sure why I kept this, Elizabeth. It's not like it's not like prize winning, to be honest with you. Hey, I I think um, it's, I think it's probably but, prize worthy. It's, and it's I'm from you, to, and a lot of people want to hear what you have to say. And I'm going to show you how many pages it was. Whoa, yeah, it's not. It's like a. It's like a. It, it's really long. So I'm so not. So when did read you the, write this? Was this when you? I'll were, tell you. Okay. Let me see. Um, it was in the '90s. Okay. And it's here it is on the, oh God, the sunlight is, that's okay. It was from a hotel in China. Oh, wow. I took, I took the um, stationery from the, there and um, I think initially the title was, I was thinking the title would be put me in coach because at the time I wasn't playing very much. Mm. And I think I started it with this sentence and then I moved on to something else. It was, you've got to earn it. It's not a right. It's a privilege. So I'm, <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to actually do this, but you got to have courage. I'm going to read just the it's first just page. <laughs> I'm going to just read the first page because okay. it's way too long and it, we do, nobody needs that. Um, and I want to just preface this poem <laughs> by this was kind of the poetry slam time, right? Mm-hmm. And I was really into urban culture and um, I love the pa- how the poets I saw, how powerful their words were and how emotional they got connected to their words. And so I think for me, these were, again, it's not a great poem, but I think it was just the emotion of the words, just, Mm -hmm. it was like, I couldn't stop my pen from writing them. And so I got to take my glasses off to read. Um, The hardcore tears, the long spent years, the ups, the downs, the smiles, the frowns. What do you want? Why are you special? Growing, growing up in the no, you can't, yes, I can generation, opening eyes, changing minds. It's mine to take if I can just make an impression, a difference. Mm-hmm. I want to be seen to make the team. Why? For who? For me? No. Yes. I'm not sure. I know f- for them. Them? They are my muse. They ignite my fuse. In the depths of my soul, they're was a hole through years of darkness, quietly alone. The anguish had a home. I never thought until you brought me into the light and showed me how to fight for a chance to make a stance for myself, to be unique at times, even a freak. Mm -hmm. Do you have H-E-A-R-T? Do you wear it on your sleeve? There is no reprieve from the intensity, the heat, the desire, the fire. Wow. That's just part of it. So I'll leave you with that. That's pretty inspiring. 
<laughs> was it just, do you remember writing it? So were you just, it, all these emotions were coming out of you before you were going to go to a game or something? You just felt like you needed to, was it therapeutic for you? Oh my gosh, totally. I'd never, ever done anything like that ever in my life. And yeah. I think I would, I honestly think I wasn't a great sleeper. I've never have really been. And, um, I, I woke, I was up in the middle of the night and it was, I think it was like in the bathroom writing. You would see how messy it was because it was, I, it was in like the real dim light and mm -hmm. I was just writing and it just came out. And then I decided this is probably not my smartest move, decided to ask the team if I could read it to them in the locker room, which I think was very brave yet. Uh -huh. They weren't really as inspired I guess, as I thought they would be. Okay. Um, cause it, as I said, it's like seven pages longer than that. And, um, but I wanted to share it with him. Like that was my way of yeah. showing them and telling them that they were really important to me and that this was important to me. And even though I never knew if I was going to play, um, that was really my inspiration. And they were yeah. my, the muses of my desire to be on the field and to mm -hmm. be better for them. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I couldn't stop it. So I'm like Julie said at the end, you know, I'm really grateful to America scores because they inspired that poem. They mm -hmm. inspire so many young people to get out of their comfort zone, to mm -hmm. use literacy and soccer as vehicles to maybe something else great that could happen in their life. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of different people that are watching this right now, Brandy. There's uh, coaches, there's former players, there's fans, and then there's a lot of young people that I know are tuning in as well. And what strikes me that's so inspiring about you is that you are truly fearless. And I think right now it, it's, it can be a challenge for people to feel that kind of freedom. There's a lot of pressure both in social media and a lot of pressure to be the best at everything no matter what it is. Yeah. And the way you approach life is just um, fearlessly and with utmost confidence. I don't know if you always feel that way, but it seems like your decisions are, are, go that way. What advice do you have to the young people of today who are watching and also coaches in just sort of being, keeping, be, being fearless and not being afraid of being told no? You can't well, do that. You're yeah, not Elizabeth, I, I'm really um, grateful for you for using fearless and for asking this question because it probably, if I, if, if I extract myself and go 10,000 feet in the air and I look back over the span of my whole life and my career and hopefully what will be in front of me too, mm -hmm. um, is that I had a woman, um, my mother, who lived just like that. And she lived openly to everyone. She was a supporter of any, anyone who came into her stratosphere. You know, I remember during when I was a professional playing for the San Jose Cyber Rays and prior to the games, the team would come and walk through the tailgating section mm. just to say thanks to the fans for coming. And we look forward to seeing you inside the stadium. And and my mom always had a massive tailgate and, and I would come up and she, you know, give me the hug and the kiss that, that, that I always loved and, and wanted. And she would introduce me to 10 people I didn't know. And I'm like, well, mom, how do you know them? I don't know. They were walking by. We invited them to, you know, to the, to the game. And, um, and we invited them to the party. And so that was just, that's just one thing. But, you know, I saw my mom go from being um, a young woman who, didn't finish college. Mm -hmm. She went on to become um, a flight attendant for United and she decided she wanted a family. And at that time, women couldn't be pregnant and have children and be a flight attendant. So she chose me, right? Mm -hmm. And and my family and then subsequently my brother. And um, so she gave up this career that she really loved. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately um, then, but not thankfully it's changed now. Obviously that's, you know, thank goodness progress. Um, but then I saw her go, you know, as a, she took care of my brother and I, as we were younger, then she became a teacher's aide at our school. Mm -hmm. And then she ended up being a vice president of a tech service, um, wow. company mm -hmm. that for the big, the big biggies in Silicon Valley back in the days, mm -hmm. IBM, Hewlett Packard, and she wore a suit to work. And I'm thinking, 
I don't see any other moms wearing a suit to work and like making big decisions. And, Mm -hmm. but she did it with such grace and Mm -hmm. such comfort. And I know it wasn't always easy, but Mm -hmm. she taught me not through sitting me down and lecturing me, but just by the way she lived every day. Mm -hmm. And, and when things didn't go well for me, she was always there to remind me good things are on the horizon Mm -hmm. and you have to recognize that uh, yes is out there. Mm -hmm. It might not be right now. Mm -hmm. It might not be in this manner or it might Mm -hmm. not look like what you thought it might, but it's there. And so Mm -hmm. you just have to persevere and you just have to keep pushing. And, and so for me, I think I am really fortunate, Elizabeth. I played with Julie Foudy and Mia Hamm and Carla Overbeck and Joy Fawcett, Christine Lilly, and the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And, and even with some of the players today, Alex Morgan, we played on Sacramento Storm together. Abby Wambach, we played together. You know, I had some really great teammates mm-hmm. who helped me live and see those things in action every day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm in the middle of a new job. I work for a company called City Cheers and we have a new app and we want to change the way everybody on this panel um, pays a bill in the restaurant and bar space. Um, and it's really hard, you know, mm-hmm. it's, you know, things mm-hmm. are not like all of a sudden we're doing it. And now it's like, boom, you know, it's right. the best thing and the biggest thing. And everybody knows about it. No, it's going right. to take patience. It's going to take time. It's going to take getting the crap kicked out of you, <laughs> you know, but you're going to stick with it. Right. And, you know, and it takes having allies like yourself and other people on this call to know that, we're, we're in it together. You know, maybe we don't say it every day, but Mm -hmm. we have a lot of people that want us to be successful. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that with my mom and that Mm -hmm. is where I think this fearlessness comes from. It's like, I don't have to fear whether I'm going to make a hundred sales sales today. Um, I don't have to fear, am I going to be the best coach today? Because I'm a work in progress and Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. I think we should all write yes is out there on our mirrors every single day. <laughs> yeah, you know, find, it'll find get your you yes. Through. Find yeah. your yes. I find know. I think, yes. I think that that's the title of your book. Um, one <laughs> last question. Um, you know, the purpose of these score soccer summits to bring the community together, learning, being inspired by top leaders in the industry. Where do you see the game of soccer going in the next five to 10 years? Where would you like it to go? Oh, Gosh, well, um, I'd love to be a part of it, Mm -hmm. Um, whether that be uh, with a new franchise here in the Bay Area, uh, which I'm involved in a group right now Mm -hmm. um, that is working to bring another team back to um, this area because soccer should live here. Mm -hmm. And it has a great, great population of people who love it and support it and want it. And so that's one. Um, I think, you know, if you can be a mentor to someone, you know, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, I think even if it's one person, you know, imagine what that one person can then do. And then that Mm -hmm. person then influences someone else. So I think we have to remember that we don't have to do grand gestures all the time Mm -hmm. and a pebble in a pond has a multiplying effect in the ripple that it can make. So um, don't be overwhelmed by trying to do so much that you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Do one thing, Mm -hmm. you know, influence one person. Mm -hmm. Even asking for help is a way to to make change and and influence, right? Mm -hmm. Give somebody a chance to be a mentor to you. Mm -hmm. I've been asking, you know, my, I see my friends in women's soccer, Courtney and Maria and Rachel, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I see Kim and, you know, I see all these names and I, and I'm thinking Casey and uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you all have been great support to me, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's powerful. Mm -hmm. No question that sisterhood, you, you no doubt have been the pebble in the pond many times. So we thank you for that. And thank you for joining us. And thank you, Julie Foudy. I know you're off doing your podcast, but she was (laughs) wonderful too. And I just really appreciate, I know I speak on behalf of everybody watching that it's been a true pleasure and a treat and inspiring and 
Um, I think <laughs> I could talk for another couple of hours, but I, I certainly appreciate you giving up your time. And this has been wonderful. Thank you. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. I, I would just, my call to action to everybody is to, is two things. One, be inspired by something mm -hmm. or someone, mm -hmm. allow yourself to be inspired. Mm -hmm. And two, pat yourself on the back for whatever it is you do today that you're like, I got that done. Mm -hmm. um, because I think our greatest advocates are ourselves, mm -hmm. right? When you're, when you need somebody else to tell you, you've done a good job, mm -hmm. I think you might be waiting and you're mm -hmm. worth the praise of way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then join our team of women in soccer uh, we, there's a place for everybody and your voice matters. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's three action items. Sorry, Elizabeth. Um, well, I, I, I can't, I can't let you go without, without mentioning, I think you were part of the first scores event in 2001, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You go way back. Yeah. It goes yeah. way back. I, I remember I did two events that I really loved one up in San Francisco and one in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, I, I think maybe that was also a part of maybe building the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative mm -hmm. and, you know, the bossy girls in that, just seeing the overall general need, number one, but also the excitement, right? Mm -hmm. What happens, uh, I've got actually a couple friends, Lisa and Tiffany in Sacramento who work with Street Soccer USA and they built literally two fields with their own damn hands. Oh, it's wow. amazing. So if any of you want to see the most incredible thing, they built these fields, these mini pitches, so uh -huh. young girls in the community and boys in the community could come and have a place to express themselves with the ball, and sometimes not with the ball. It was it's hilarious. <laughs> they said, "Okay, you have to do some kind of move before you score." They sent me a, a, a video, and these two girls literally danced for about a minute, uh -huh. and then the ball into the goal, and it was glorious, you yeah. know. But it was yeah. there. It was them expressing themselves. So yeah. there's a lot of good people doing a lot of great things. Yeah. And, you know, just, you know, I think we have to support each other and we just mm -hmm. have to continue influencing one person at a time. And uh, we will, we are the, the next great leaders and the future of our country, mm -hmm. without a doubt. It's mm -hmm. undeniable. And so let's, we're building the foundation that we're all going to stand on. Yeah, no question. Randy. Thank you so much. Awesome. Keep in Thank touch. Thank you, America and I know that scores. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe we'll get to the, you know, part one A B C D <laughs> later. I want you to publish it. I think it was beautiful. It was so inspiring. I love that. It's just neat that that just sort of came to you as, yeah. as you were. You know, it's a great kind of memory of that time, and yeah, I think we should all have that. It's awesome. All right. Thank okay, you, Brandy. Have a great day. All the day. best. Enjoy.